uh, one of two executive directors of Camp My Vote. I had been involved with the, the organization behind Count My Vote and some of the organizers uh, for a few years now. And uh, I, just by way of brief background, I uh, worked in the Lieutenant Governor's office for a while, and I just left there in May to come on and count my vote as they started to prepare for the initiative. And so I um, have a bit of background in it, but uh, it's kind of the first time I've ever done anything full-time politically like this. So um, I'm, I'm a state delegate in the Republican Party, uh, and I'm from Draper. So, Southern Solid County. Uh, this is David May. David May uh, is uh, helping count my vote out. He's done a lot of great stuff for us as a volunteer uh, and uh, as a supporter. And uh, we're excited to have this out here today. So. And Brent over here, uh, Brent is going to be taking video and photos of the hearing. And just so everybody knows, uh, the law actually requires us to submit either minutes of the hearing with detailed information, or we can actually record audio video. And then we, we have to submit that to the Lieutenant Governor, and that becomes public. So just so everybody knows that the, all the proceedings are public, and they will be posted through the Lieutenant Governor's website. Uh, just so if you have any concern about that, uh, just be aware of it now. So I'm kind of scared myself. Um, so I think you know the format of the hearing today is we want to, today's uh, hearing is less political and more informational from our perspective. I know sometimes that's a, uh, a bit of a gray area, but we really want to present kind of the information behind Count My Vote. And I think most important to us today is to talk less about the politics on both sides of Count My Vote. Uh, and to talk more about the actual technical nuts and bolts of what our direct primary would look like so that voters, so you all actually know if this is something that you choose to support, to sign the petition, or something that you would oppose. Uh, a lot of times we get caught up in political messaging and we don't always understand the, the details you know, of the actual policy. So I, I apologize, apologize ahead of time. It's going to be boring and detailed, and you'll probably, I'm not very good at this, so please be patient with me. But the idea is to hopefully answer your questions and uh, discuss what this would actually look like. And then we also have dedicated a big part of these hearings is to receive public comment and to ask questions. And so it, I think today, if it's OK with you all, maybe we can do that conversationally rather than wait to the end and be formal about it and have you stand and take turns. If that's okay, I think if we can do that in a way that allows us to proceed in an efficient manner, is that okay? So if you have, as we're going through the presentation, if you have a question, if you have a comment, uh, please feel free to ask and, and I'll do my best. Uh, so let's, uh, so we have a presentation here to kind of walk through some of the elements and count my vote. And uh, so please, again, uh, don't, don't hesitate to uh, ask or, or to comment if you'd like to. So we'll go ahead and get started. So the drive behind Count My Vote is that we believe that all Utah voters should be able to participate in choosing candidates for elected office of their chosen party. And so we believe that every vote should count in that sense. One of the Really, the drive behind Count My Vote is to address the participation issue in Utah. What we've seen in Utah is we have gone from being a top five state in voter participation in the nation to now being a bottom 10 state. Our voting age population turnout rate in 2012 was 51.4%. Uh, and uh, that, we believe that there's an issue there, and it's a systemic issue. Utahns are very engaged in their communities. They volunteer a lot of hours, they serve a lot of hours, and they care a lot about civic issues. Utah consistently ranks number one in the nation in terms of that volunteer engagement. And those are typically the signs, along with high education and strong families, that lead to strong voter turnout. Utah has all these elements that would lead to high voter turnout as a state, but we're in the bottom 10. And so we believe that that's a, a systematic issue. 
and we believe that that issue is the cost system. Uh, what we have seen nationwide is we've seen a gradual process to open elections to participation. In Utah, however, we have seen kind of a reverse trend. Taylor, we, yeah, I, sure. I just have one quick question because you, you were saying that you felt like the caucus turnout um, is what led to both participation and the voters turnout, right? The caucus system, the caucus is, system. is a main contributing factor, we believe, in so our opinion. So how do you explain that we just got through having a primary in the municipal elections? And I know in my city there was only 9% that showed up to vote. And there's no caucus involved. In fact, the caucus has actually driven more people out to vote than a straight primary. Uh, sure. In, in comparing general election turnout to municipal turnout, it's just it's not a fair comparison. However, more people participated in municipal elections than participated in the caucus system. In 2011, 215,000 voters voted in their municipal elections. Last year in the caucus system, uh, just under 200,000 participated in caucuses, and that was a record high turnout in Utah. So it, it's not quite a fair comparison in that sense. So, so have you checked the data for this last caucus, this last primary? Because it was extremely low throughout the state, less than 10 For the min municipal primary? Yeah. Not yet. We'll look at that. Yeah, That's a good point. Very low compared yeah. to what the caucus was in 2012. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, oh, sure. Any other questions or comments on that? No. What's your why, why do you think that the municipal elections have a higher turnout than the city? Why? Why do you think they do? They don't. They don't. Well, the municipals don't. The city mayors. Don't. Yeah. No. I, what I said was the municipals have a higher turnout than the caucuses. Right. Why do you think that is? Uh, I th I think a lot of people would point to a lot of reasons. I don't know for sure, so I would hesitate to answer. Yeah. And is this measuring, um, when you say caucus per per participation, is this measuring across the Republican, Democrat, and Yeah, both parties. All parties. Yeah. Yeah, both parties. And so in Utah, we, we used a primary, a direct primary system from 1937 to 1947. And after that time, we went back to the caucus system. And then we saw in the early and mid to late 90s, the threshold in the caucus system was uh, lowered by the parties progressively from 80% to 70% and then to 60% where it is now. And that means that if I'm a candidate and I want to get on a primary election ballot, I have to receive at least more than 40% of delegates votes in order to force a primary. And that's the highest barrier to entry for candidates anywhere in the nation. And so we believe that Utah's, Utah's trend has been the reverse of the national trend. Uh, on the national side, it's been to open the election process to engage as many voters as possible. In Utah, the trend has been to limit and limit the nomination process to a smaller group of individuals. So go ahead to the next slide, David. I apologize for the fonts here. It's hard to read. We'll get that fixed. And this is all going to be up on our website, by the way, uh, so that you can refer to that. And we'll get those fonts updated so if the that's right. So, yeah, do you have a question? Why do you think that, uh, why do you come to that conclusion that the, the caucus system is, is trying to well, the parties did that. The parties themselves chose to lower the threshold from 80 to 70. Do I don't know. I, I wasn't there. I, I wouldn't want to speak to that. I wasn't in those was meetings. That was in the 90s. And so, you, you shouldn't quote it if you don't know. Well, the you fact is the parties, yes. the parties did that. I don't know why they did it because I wasn't there. But look, well, they did do it. Well, but you're saying you want to change it, so you must have a reason why. Right, and we'll, we'll get to that, yeah. I just don't want to speak for the parties because I wasn't there. He's just giving facts. So I'm, just, I'm trying to be as fact-based as I can. Sure. So, uh, okay, so again, the caucus system is most states in the country used a caucus system uh, 100 years ago. And that was, well, we believe that was the most common way that people participated in politics then. And since that time, states, most states have gone away from the caucus system. Uh, we believe it's antiquated because we don't participate in politics today as we did 100 years ago. Now, one of the issues that we'll talk a little bit more about here uh, is the fact that Currently, the only way to participate in caucus meetings is to be physically present at those caucus meetings. And what that does is it excludes a lot of Utahns. 
a lot of Utah voters. We also, 100 years ago, election day, elections were also limited to one day, to a similar moment in time. But since that time, we have modernized and we have expanded election day to include early voting, to include by mail voting, and to include online voting for military and for our overseas voters. And so, again, this is part of this trend to modernize and to include more voters in that process. But Utah's caucus system is still limited to only those who can be physically present. And so that, that really just leaves out a lot of Utah voters who can't be there. So, yeah. I read in the paper, how, or actually I heard the uh, press conference and CMB came out. Yeah. And they were, had a military man, no wait, the surgeon in the emergency room, a stay-at-home mom. Uh-huh, yeah. And a missionary. Uh-huh. And you're trying to include them into the caucus. But for this meeting, how did you include the military and the missionary? Yeah, sure, that's a good question. Uh, we, we understand those who can't be here phys you know, physically present here at our hearings. And so we have the online hearing on Saturday at noon that will be hosted through our website uh, where anyone and everyone can participate in the hearing and submit questions and comments uh, remotely. So every missionaries that are out there in the field? Well, I don't know. The mission president lets them. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, certainly I, I would hope that, that they would be allowed, but I, yeah. So there is that resource available online for the online hearing. That's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, so again, uh, we believe the caucus system, it's antiquated and it just excludes too many Utah voters. So go ahead. The other real issue that we see in the caucus system is that it, it really disenfranchises certain groups of voters. A really great example of that is women in the state of Utah. Women vote consistently at higher rates than men. Uh, voters of all votes. Uh, women, 53% of all votes cast are cast by women. However, in the caucus system, only in the Republican Party, for example, only 25% of state delegates are women. In the Democratic Party, they don't do much better. It's 43% of state delegates are women. And women vote at higher rates in both parties. So that's to us, we see that as an issue. Yeah, sure. Did you, have you been to the caucuses and seen the ratio there of people who are actually voting at the caucuses? Uh, only in my caucus where I was elected the delegate, so I, that's all I can Mine was easily uh, 50 -50. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure some are, yeah. Do you have the statistics that show how many women actually ran to be delegates? Because what if they're choosing not to be a delegate? I mean, there's a lot of time commitment mm -hmm. because that's what makes the system work is that people have to actually get candidates. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're choosing not to. Sure, that's a good point. Yeah. So I think that should be, you know, part of your your presentation. Yeah, that's a good point. How many people were nominated? How many got elected? Because just to look at a, a number. Yeah, I, I would ask uh, the parties perhaps to to see if they would have that data and from the attendance for the list. That's a good question. Yeah. Another question back. Yeah. So being a woman in Utah, I actually had the opposite experience where I just felt like nothing I did matter because I had no idea about the caucus system. It was like a well-kept secret. But that's been coming out more and more and the party, did, at least the Republican Party, did a great deal to advertise it and get people out there in the last couple of times. And, and my experience was I felt empowered by it. I felt like, good, here I can you know, actually have an influence and get to know the candidates and get to know the people representing me. And I felt like there was actually hope of making a difference after attending caucuses, whereas before, when all I knew about was primaries and general elections, it just didn't feel yeah. like anything made a difference. And I felt like this was just better and more communal and gets more people involved because it's neighbors getting together and talking to each other about things. Whereas in a primary, you're just isolated, and if you remember, you remember, and if you don't, you don't. And all you get is little tidbits in the mail, which, you know, half a sentence, and there's no depth to it. Mm -hmm. No, it's a fair point. In my opinion, if, this, if the reverse were true, if 75% of our delegates were women, I think we'd be in better hands. So, yeah, that's a very good point, yeah. I felt just the opposite in our caucus. I mean, uh, we were just put down. Didn't have a chance. Mm -hmm. It's a handful of other states actually use, still have a convention system, right? So we're not an outlier in that sense. 
But we are an outlier in that Utah is the only state in the country that has given political parties the power to totally preclude a primary election for statewide and for national offices. Uh, no other state in the country uh, doesn't have a primary election for its statewide and for its national offices. And so Utah is an outlier in that regard. Other states that have a convention system, go ahead and go to the next one, David. Oh, sure, sorry about that. But why does that matter? Why do we need to be like every other state? Yeah, yeah and, and that's certainly not what we're saying. It's just informational. Yeah, I, I think Utah's great, and I the unique things about Utah make us great personally. So that's a good point, yeah. What are the advantages of having a primary? Having a primary election? It's uh, costly. <laughs> it gives the other party all to attack each other so that the other party can come in and, and attack. Sure. Yeah. No, and there's, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a good point. Yeah. Well, I think it's important to, to realize that in Connecticut, when they when they have changed their system, the Republicans haven't been able to, to win a state seat since then. And they're, they're actually... And in fairness, to, that's Connecticut. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I know, but yeah. before they were. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're reevaluating the fact that it's not working too well for the party. Yeah. If you're a Republican, sure. that yeah. would be a concern. You, know, Absolutely. you wouldn't want to give yeah. up. Yeah. 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 But it's not just Connecticut. It's happened in Nevada, Delaware, Missouri, and Indiana in the last four years. Mm -hmm. So... Why do we want to go there? Sure. Yeah. My concern, the reason why I want to go there, is that I, I attended a state, a, a state convention last year for the first time, and I saw it actually happens. And in, in, in truth, the people who get sent to the uh, to be elected are selected by fewer than 2,000 people. 2,483, right? Yeah, and, and yeah. The, the notion of the caucus system saying it's representative uh, doesn't really uh, ring true if you actually attend a state convention. The, st the people attending the state convention feel like they're empowered to make a decision. That yeah. they're, that they're, they're, uh, they're representatives. They're supposed to be representing uh, the people that they, they were le that elected them but only in the first ballot. Yeah, no, that's a good point, certainly. So let's move on and talk a little bit about, just kind of compare. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the exclusion element here. And so as a delegate, uh, that's the reality is a lot of Utahns who are registered to vote simply can't participate in the caucus system because they can't be physically present. Now. Interestingly, are UACAVA voters in Utah? Uh, UACAVA is an acronym, and it refers to military and overseas voters. They actually vote at a higher rate than other Utah voters. Uh, nearly 70% of them are all active voters, but yet they're all left out of the caucus system because they can't be there in person. Go ahead, David. We talked a little bit about the unfair elements, uh, talking about the issue with women. Another real issue is age. 63% uh, of delegates are over 45 years old, and 45, 44% of voters are over 45. So again, older voters have or much more representation in the caucus system. Uh, also with that, interesting fact uh, for young voters, Young voters often have a bad rap for not participating in elections, and rightly so in a lot of cases. However, uh, votes cast by 18 to 24 year old voters in Utah account for about 15, 16% of all votes cast. However, in the caucus system, only 2% of all statewide delegates are between the ages of 18 and 24. So even though they're less likely to vote in elections, they're far less likely to be a delegate and have the ability to nominate candidates in the caucus system. So uh, I see if you, I think you were first up there. Does that number represent uh, how many young people attend the caucuses? Because if they attend the caucus and send a delegate who's older, I'm not sure that's a fair comparison because maybe they just decided this older person has yeah. more time and ability. To I, I, and I wish the parties would, I think it would be helpful if the parties actually recorded and published that data. And it'd be helpful to ask them to do that. We'd have a better sense of what it looks like. Yeah. There are quite a few young. Yeah. So I mean, you keep saying that I wish they'd published that, but aren't you moving forward with a with an idea here that isn't grounded with solid metrics? Because uh, 
if you don't have that information, that's that's the data. That's the well, data. one uh, perhaps to that point, one of the issues with the caucus system is that the records aren't kept uniformly. They're kept by precinct chairs in thousands of different ways, and that opens the system to, to real issues and voter fraud and systematic well, that, that data issues. Next. So, yeah. but what we do know, we do know who those, who those delegates are, and that's the data we're pointing to. We're only talking about we have what we actually know for sure. Yeah, I so, yeah. yeah. Well, question. just just you know, you were just mentioning that the, the precinct chairs do things differently. Actually, it's very uniform, and they're giving they're given their information from the state party on how to get people registered. So that's all uniform. That's well, different. I just went to lunch with Thomas Wright, Thomas Wright last week, and yeah. he wishes it were uniform. It is, it is uniform. It should be, but it's not. But okay, I, I let's move on. I want to make a comment about women in the fact that sure. I, if you don't bring up the fact that in Utah specifically, and this is part of our problem in education, we are known for having large families, and someone has to be home with the kids, and we have a culture that really encourages moms to be home. Mm -hmm. So why are we using a statistic that really takes away from the value of our state because women are choosing to be at home with their kids versus going to a, a caucus meeting? So they shouldn't be delegates? What if they're choosing not to? Yeah. Then that's their choice. I mean, that's their culture. That's what we're being, I mean, we've got babies in this room. I mean, someone has to be taking care of these babies, right? It, sure, and that's a valid opinion. Moms. Okay. So yeah. let's let's move on. We're taking I, a lot I, of comments from the same people, and that's fine, but we I also need to make progress. I just okay. parts of your marginalization, disenfranchising yeah. of voters. Um, I'm considered, I guess, on the younger scale voters. Um, I tried to be a delegate twice, didn't make it both times. Uh -huh. So I had a reason to have to sour grapes on the matter. But that being said, the nature of the caucus system is that it's neighborhoods. It's people you know, people you drive past the house every day. And so those people are electing the people they feel have the most wisdom to go to the convention and, and make those decisions for the for the so quoting a metric and saying that that because it's older people who are delegates, it's disenfranchising younger. It isn't necessarily true. In fact, it's probably not true because the people themselves voted those delegates. They looked at the people who presented to them and gave them the reason they should be a delegate and saw the wisdom in those people. For sure. The most part, and yeah, I, I no, I appreciate that. And the reality is, we're simply talking about the data. We're talking about what we know, and I think but, every experience is different. So but we're just not. looking at the data. And so David, let's go ahead and move on if we can. So again, talking about some of the other states that do use a convention system, uh, Utah's barrier to entry for candidates is 40%. That's, like I said before, that's the highest barrier for candidates in the country. Uh, Colorado's convention has a 30% primary. A and again, all of these states require a primary for statewide or for national office. So we're talking about other primary elections, not those. 30% in Colorado, 15% uh, in Connecticut, which means if I get 15% of those votes at convention, I force a primary. So there's there's a big disparity there between uh, Utah and Connecticut, for example. And then New Mexico's barrier is or threshold is 20%. Go ahead, David. So this is an interesting uh, number here. Uh, this the 0.002% uh, is based on 7,000 total. Uh, statewide delegates in both major parties. There are 3,974 uh, state delegates in the Republican Party, and there are uh, 2,700 state delegates in the Democratic Party. And the denominator is Utah's population, which is the U.S. Census Bureau, which I got 2.8 million. Uh, and so again, the idea is here, we have a very small group of individuals that are making choices in terms of candidates. Um, will Count My Vote affect um, how we do our voting in the, at the county level? No. Count My Vote only deals with partisan primary elections. Okay, and so, so those county counties. Partisan. So it, yes, yeah, so those counties, or sorry, not municipal elections, right? Yeah, but the county that. elections that are partisan will be impacted, yes, okay, by, so then that by our proposal. That's correct because we actually have closer to 30,000 delegates statewide. We're, and county. we're just, again, like I explained, this number is based on that 7,000 figure. But so why are you using a lower number when there's actually more delegates that are involved? It's, it, it, that's a, sure, that's a fair comment. Yeah. The population, is that based off of the entire state's population or the registered voters in the state? That's the state's population. Okay. Yeah, like it says, Utah's 
populations. Okay, David, go ahead. Okay, so it's, it was important to the organizers of Count My Vote that they not just jump to a citizen's initiative petition because a citizen's initiative petition, uh, number one, it's extremely difficult in Utah, and we believe rightly so. Uh, we've seen some of the issues in California where initiatives are regular, commonplace, and very expensive. Uh, and in Utah, an initiative is, is not easy, and again, rightly so. So Count My Vote over the last two years uh, worked with the legislature diligently to effect change through the legislature, and uh, the legislature refused to act on the issue. Count My Vote also worked with the political parties over the last two years uh, to effect change to expand participation in the caucus system. And the parties uh, voted not to do that. Uh, in, on the re I can speak to the Republican side because I was there as a state delegate. Uh, actually, a majority of Republican state delegates voted in favor of proposals to adjust the threshold, to expand participation, but we didn't reach the two-thirds supermajority required by the party bylaws, and so those weren't passed. Taylor? The, the, party, the party delegates also, uh, there was a fourth proposal brought on May 18th to study ways to increase participation, and the delegates voted against taking the vote on it. And so, again, and then on the Democratic side, uh, the delegates narrowly uh, missed the two-thirds vote required uh, to, to pass change to, actually, they were proposing to go to a different primary in the Democratic Party, and they just fell short of that two-thirds requirement, although a majority of those Democratic delegates did vote in favor of that change. And so, we're at a point now, and actually just last month, the state Republican Party State Central Committee uh, voted against uh, Chairman Evans' proposal uh, to expand uh, participation in the caucus system. So, Count My Vote has been diligent over the last two years in working with the legislature and in working with the political parties to have those changes made through those avenues. But because the, legislat the, the legislature didn't act and the parties, the delegates voted against it, we are now at a point where the only remaining option is a citizen's initiative petition. And so that's that's why we're going that route. So, yeah, go ahead. Taylor, that, yeah. that statistic that you quoted from the state, well, I was at the state convention and actually that failed on the threshold. 1243 to 1050, the delegates voted against increasing the threshold. Okay. okay. So that's incorrect information. So I have different numbers on that, but we can maybe talk later. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. you can look them up. They're, they're on the Lieutenant Governor's website. Okay. So the other okay. thing is the State Central Committee is actually going to be voting on a package of changes that um, address all the concerns that Count My Vote has. They're, they're in the works of making that. I, yeah, I heard that they're perhaps voting on the 26th. And so we'll, we'll see what they do, but they've voted against it so many times that we're, we can't wait for them to happen well, anymore. So, yeah. There was another comment or question? Yeah. You said that, um, was that Evans, I guess? Uh, Chairman Dean. Chairman yeah. Evans yeah. Uh, had proposals. At the Bountiful State Central Committee meeting last month. Okay, what were those? I don't know all the details there of those. There was only one proposal. Yeah, do you know what that was it exactly? It was to um, actually penalize the caucuses if they didn't have a particular um, threshold of attendance that they would penalize the citizens in the neighborhood and um, change the threshold at convention uh -huh. and um, it was felt that that was a very negative way to influence people mm -hmm. in being involved. Okay. And we so they were trying to, to assign the number of delegates to the precinct based on the yeah, number we would of rather, them. We would rather, you know, give people incentives to participate in the process instead of, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, you know, thank you. Negative. So go ahead, David. Okay, so just so we understand the current system, I, I think a lot of two. Uh, right now, the way it works is uh, the parties hold caucus meetings. Uh, those are usually uh, held in uh, in March, and uh, often on weeknights. Uh, I believe the Democratic Party uh, caucus was on Tuesday night, mid March last year. Republicans was on Thursday night last year, and at those caucus meetings. Uh, voters in a precinct gather together with their fellow party voters in that precinct, and then they vote on those delegates. They select county delegates and state delegates. And then in the, and then those delegates either go to a state convention or to a county convention, and they then choose and vote on the nominees for that party at that convention. And so again, as we've discussed, in order to get a primary election, a candidate must receive more than 40% of the delegate vote. If one candidate receives 60% or more, 
then that candidate automatically becomes that party's nominee and advances to the general election uh, as that party's nominee on the ballot. So that's that's how the system is currently. Yeah. Are you aware that that's not accurate in many counties, like Cache County is 70 percent threshold, so 30 percent? Yeah. Some counties are 90 10. Yeah, and we're yeah we're talking about the the state yeah the state convention because there is sometimes some difference in the different counties. Yeah, it's a very good point. Thank you. Your affects all the counties, so. Right. It, it affects. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. What? Why is all the focus just on the state? I mean, I, I, is, why all, all the focus just on the four thousand delegates, and not all the people who elected? The no. We're yeah. We're, it affects everything. It talks about the state. It talks about the counties too. We're just trying to provide the information in, in different ways, and this is the most effective in this way. So that, that's a fair point. Everything's yeah. focused on the state level. Sure, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Do you know how Hatch won if he won at convention, or did he go to a primary? And about Lee and Lee a primary. Election. It was a primary election. Yeah, in both of those went to primary elections. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I I have a concern. Benedict. I know that um, the, this group has criticized the GOP for holding the convention in the middle of the week on a Wednesday at seven o'clock. Um, but I'm wondering why are you holding this meeting? at noon in the middle of the day when most people are working can't attend and it's UEA, the teachers and parents who want to go to UEA can't attend here sure. and notification was very sparse and yeah. it's uh, an electronic uh, message to No, it was people. published in papers throughout the state and distributed by email. Well, yeah. I didn't even uh, see that. well we're glad you're here anyway. Thank you for but, being but here. I know, and then we're also following up with the online can, hearing on Saturday so finish? everybody can join. Can yeah, oh, yeah, sure. Okay, you're criticizing attendance at caucus that you're prevent that the GOP is preventing people from going because they're holding it in the middle of the week. No, I mean, I you're holding we, this meeting in the middle of the day when a lot of people who would like to question you or find out what your your proposals are can't attend because you're choosing a really bad time. We have another one tonight at seven. We have we have six more hearings Where's throughout that the state. At it's at Salt Lake Community College. Well, I, I, again, I know it's a drive, <laughs> but we're having seven hearings throughout the state, and we're having the online hearing on Saturday for anybody who can't be here. And we would like to be doing these hearings. And again, this is this is the first step of public outreach, right? That we're required that we're going through things here in Logan and then, uh, throughout the state, and then anyone who couldn't attend the hearing in person is welcome to participate on the online hearing on Saturday. Yeah. Uh, in the interest of time. Could we see what you do know and then discuss what you don't know? Thank after? you. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so let's move on. Thank you. Very good point. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we we believe that modernizing our election system and implementing the direct primary uh, it will facilitate greater participation. Uh, it will improve candidates' access to the primary election ballot. It will preserve the power of political parties to select their nominees. And we'll talk about exactly how that is how and why. Uh, it also reduces the potential for fraud and election irregularities. And the real big thing here is that it removes the systematic obstacle to participation. Go ahead, David. So here's how uh, the Count My Vote direct primary election would work. Uh, first and foremost, we're not proposing a open primary like California currently has. We're proposing a direct primary. An open primary is when candidates the top two candidates, regardless of party affiliation, advance to the general election. So you could have two Democrats, two Republicans, two Libertarians. It doesn't matter in terms of their party affiliation. What and we are not doing that. What we are doing is a direct primary election where candidates become a nominee for their party, and then as their party's nominee, they go to the general. So it's a, it's a different system, and it's the most commonly used system around the country. So what we, what the Count My Vote Direct Primary would do, is indicated by this, uh, this green arrow here, is it would allow uh, potential candidates to get on a primary election ballot by means of being nominated by their fellow registered affiliated party voters. And the way they would do that is by collecting 2% of signatures from 2% of the registered voters who are affiliated with their same party in their jurisdiction, the jurisdiction for which they're running. And by getting those 2% signatures, that would then place them on that party's primary ballot as a candidate for that party. Yeah. Um, so 
in a statewide race where you have the Senate and um, and then your state officers, governor, or your governor, your attorney general, all of those offices, yeah. two percent you could get that with just staying within Salt Lake and Utah counties. Um, I when I was a kid, I remember Mike Lovett was running for governor, and he came to my house in mm -hmm. Lewiston, Utah, to yeah. a cottage meeting to talk yeah. with the people. Mm -hmm. If that's your the way that you're going about it, what's to prevent all of these rural areas and small towns from having like what's why as a candidate would you spend your political time and capital making Yeah, it well, and, and that's a little bit we hear that a lot, and it's a little bit of a misnomer because parties actually apportion the number of delegates in each precinct based on population and affiliation and party performance. And they're voting. And so perhaps. actually 60%, for example, and again, I, I talk about the Republican Party state delegates a lot because I am one, and I know those that I'm most familiar with that situation. 60% of Republican Party state delegates live along the Wasatch Front. So can't, you know, can't, it doesn't change the terms but of, I was of in the there focus. For, I actually live in Box Elder County, um, yeah. and I live in far west Box Elder uh -huh. County, and we have one of the most spread out um, precincts. Yeah. And we actually have three state delegates because of the participation that we have on the voting right. level. And um, I look at Box Elder County is one of those counties that is not as apt to have candidates come when it's not important, and most of the time it's not. Um, I just don't see that that's going to improve. Sure. Yeah. And that, that makes it easy to franchise the smaller yeah. community. Go ahead. That's actually my biggest concern with Kelly. But I've lived in a lot of states that have not had the caucus system. I'm born and raised in California. I've lived in Idaho. I've lived in Arizona. And this is the only state I've lived in where candidates running for national mm -hmm. positions and statewide positions come to communities like Cache Valley, go to Ridge County, go to counties where people really mm -hmm. aren't living in a big city. And it's something that I really value because they take. They take the time to listen to the voters in these rural areas, mm -hmm. whereas where, county, where states that have this direct primary system, they don't, because the big cities are what's going to get them elected. Mm -hmm. They take time to visit those little caucuses, and those become delegates. The rest are in the No, there's no limit. And everybody who qualifies and is nominated by their fellow party voters would be on the ballot. So you could have potential 30, 40, 40. Well, and, and actually that's how it is currently in law. Uh, those who are not affiliated with the party can obtain signatures under current Utah law and go straight to a general election ballot. And how often does that happen? And how um, often is that process for them? They have to obtain, uh, I'm not sure on the exact number of signatures, I believe it's a thousand signatures. And then they automatically advance to the general election ballot. And I don't, yeah, I don't know the frequency, but I do know that we had uh, one or two in 2012. You know, we, we often have uh, anywhere from six to 12 candidates on the general election ballot. Some of them are affiliated to go that route. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate you not having the hearings. I know it's required as well as good that you're doing it. Um, why is this diagram that he's on the website, the explanations of how, the, how you like the system to work? What now? How, why isn't the diagram and the explanation on your on your website for people to? It actually has been. We took it off to try to update it, and we need to get our fonts fixed. And I'll, we'll put it up today. So if you go to the website tonight, it will be there. This, this exact presentation will be there. But uh, our actual initiative language, the actual full text, the legal language is there right now, yes. and the constitutional note and letter, all that, all that's there right now. And also, uh, all that's available in our fiscal note too that we'll talk about in a minute. The fiscal note is also there, and it's on the lieutenant governor's website as well. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, quick question: To qualify to be a candidate now, everybody pays the same fee, like four hundred dollars or something. It's not. It varies by office, and it's yeah, set it's by the legislature. Yeah. Office. It looks like wouldn't this require Republicans to raise a lot more signatures than Democrats? Depending on where they live and for what office they're running. Yeah, you know, in Cache County, it would be five to one or so. Uh, is there a purpose for having a higher burden on some parties than other parties? It's equal. It's two percent. It's not equal. It's uh, a thousand more signatures. Well, it, I, I tease my Democratic friends by saying it's actually going to be a lot harder for you because you have to go and find those Democrats. So. <laughs> 
So, um, but the I, the point is behind that two percent threshold is that we the intent is to have the legitimacy or a kind of a, somewhat of a minimal barrier to non-serious candidates, and to but to not have a threshold that's so high that just the average person can't go and get those signatures. So to give some uh, perspective, a statewide candidate, a statewide Republican Party candidate uh, for governor, for example, would have to collect about 11,300 signatures of registered Republicans. A statewide candidate, a Democratic candidate for governor, would have to collect about 3,500 signatures. Uh, and depending on where you live, a, a state House candidate would have to gather anywhere from 30 to 100 signatures, and on the Senate side, probably 70 to 150 signatures, depending on the party and where they live. So does this have to be distributed throughout the state, or is it just 2% of the party? For like, for like governor, would they have to be in a certain number of Senate districts, or? We talked about that, actually, <clears throat> but uh, we thought that would be a bit too onerous of a barrier to put on the average, the average voter who wanted to become a candidate. And so it's just 2% of that party's total registered voters in that jurisdiction. So that's a good point. Yeah. So I worked on a campaign for both the caucus and a primary. And it's incredibly difficult and expensive to work a primary. Um, it can be really deterring for some candidates to know they have to go through that primary um, right away. Whereas if you do the caucus system, it's more focused and less expensive, but it's still very personal. Um, I don't know. I felt like it was very effective to be able to do that to your caucus. So I would, I mean, I know that you're trying to focus on inclusion, but as far as candidates go, I feel like it's almost more exclusive because then, of course, they're going to a primary, and then then they have to do expensive radio ads and mailers that just don't go into very much depth. And the depth is a big deal. Go ahead. In order to be a part of that, to Keep your voice out to as many people as possible. That takes a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Be yourself on the radio, possibly television. That's something that you have to have a special interest group behind to be with me for something like that. So in reality, yeah, I that's think a good it kind point. of diminishes representation in the fact that we'll talk about that actually. Less, yeah. Are we almost there? It still preserves the party's power to select nominees because it's the registered affiliated voters of any of the party that are choosing their candidates. And so the party still has the ability to, to choose their candidates. In addition, we're not doing away with the caucus convention system. The parties can still hold the caucus meetings and conventions to endorse their chosen candidate, which is how a lot of other states do it. They could get behind a candidate, they can endorse someone. Uh, we're changing the access point to the ballot by means of the signatures of voters and the delegates. Um, so let's go ahead, Dave. Let's, yeah, let's go on. What's our timeline? Oh, yeah, go ahead. What's the purpose of endorsing a candidate at that point? Dude, I, that would be up to the parties to choose why and how they do that. Does it, does it count? I mean, is it just like moral support kind of a thing? Or? A lot of other states do it, and I, I, I have you look at how they do it and why they do it. So, go ahead, David. So, uh, an important issue for us with Count My Vote is that our initiative language was legally and constitutionally sound. Uh, that we are sure that we have the ability to do this in Utah, do it legally, and do it constitutionally. And so we uh, submitted a, a lengthy, a comprehensive constitutional memo to uh, the Lieutenant Governor's Office uh, with a supporting letter signed by uh, these 15 former uh, Utah State Bar Presidents, essentially asserting that this is clearly constitutional and that this is, uh, you know, if it were to be implemented, that it would not become an issue in that sense. So go ahead, David. So uh, the fiscal estimate uh, is important. Yesterday, uh, the Governor's Office of Management and Budget uh, released the final fiscal estimate. As you can see, uh, there, if, if our initiative were to be implemented, there would be a one-time cost of $48,000, and then there would be ongoing costs uh, every two years in general elections of $890,000. So that's, that's the fiscal estimate that was released and that will be printed in all of our uh, signature packets. Okay, can you describe a little bit what that money's for? Uh, no, the, the letter's on our website and on their website. No, no, I, I want to know, I don't what, know. What this, what's the cost of what? Printing? I, I don't know. That I, that, they went through the analysis and did the estimate, and I, 
I'm, I'm sure you some of those details know. are on their website. You, you do know. Is it cost to, to uh, the governor's office or is it the cost to the party? There's no cost to the party. So this is cost to the taxpayer. This is the this is the public funds out of the state budget. So the state public dollars every two years. Right? So that would be every two years. Okay, so there's been no assessment done on what it would cost the parties to switch to a primary. Right? You don't know that. I, I, you'd have to ask the parties. I don't know. Yeah. By comparison, how much does it cost the state to run the current elections? I think that's a critical number to compare. Yeah, substantial. It's just going to be a substantial number. Substanti yeah, substantially more. And I don't have the exact number, but um, we do know that, uh, that this number, in terms of the overall budget and in terms of the overall cost of election administration, it is very small. And again, this was just very released yesterday, and so yeah, I think there we can look at that and look at some more information. Uh, and GOMB has this up on their website. So, yeah. So is this taking into account like the cost that it would um, take for county clerks to verify the signatures Correct. among everything the, the people that are running, every yeah. single person that puts forth. So that number could possibly change if you have. 50 candidates that are running, you have more no, people they, have check? Yeah, no, they did a pretty comprehensive analysis, and this is based on what I believe would be their best case scenario in terms of the most people running. So, and again, I, I don't know the, the detail breakdown because that's the governor's office of management and budget, but I, I would assume that the detailed analysis would be public information too. I haven't seen it yet. So, okay, David, go ahead and move on. One more on the money. So, okay, go ahead. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, sir, but I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but um, you guys are paid within the account I vote, correct? Uh, few of us, very few of us. I'm, I'm it's probably 75% volunteer time, but I'm getting a small stipend to do this. Okay. But I, that just started. I'm, I'm mostly volunteer. I, I, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, just sure. saying. No, yeah, okay. So the money thing is an issue. I, you know, you pointed to that, and there's, you know, we often hear, and the cute opposition is buy my vote. I think it's fun. Um, the, you know, the idea is that, or the concern is that primary elections would automatically be more expensive. Uh, we don't know exactly what that will look like in Utah, but what we do know is that there's a lot of money currently being spent in the caucus system. Uh, the FEC has given Utah a additional election cycle, actually, for the caucus system because there's so much money being spent. This this data is pulled from last year, where statewide campaigns for the Republican Party spent 6.5 million dollars just on caucuses in the convention, and, that was and and so that's a substantial amount of money. And the the real issue there is that all that money is going to influence. 2,483 votes. That's 60% of the threshold that's required to become that party's nominee. So there currently is a lot of money being spent in the caucus system, so but it's being targeted on only a very small number of, of people. This elements. is pre-primary, not Correct. post primary. Correct. Yep. Or pre-convention, not versus This is post yeah, this is essentially Wednesday. up to mid-April. Okay, but are you implying at that amount cost? The party, the money, or it was this the is campaign the, donations. These are the campaigns. And the campaign spent that, that money. A lot of it. Yeah. See, so there's going to be even more if you go to a primary. I don't know that, but what I do know is if twice that amount was spent in a primary election, it amounts to about twenty-five dollars per voter in that party. So there's a lot of money being spent in the caucus system, and there's a lot of money being spent on a very small number of people. Yeah, you had a question? Well, I just have a comment. I've been doing caucuses for 20 years, and we started out with six people, and we've grown, grown to about 30, 35 people, which is really, really nice. Last year, for the first time, I found that there were a lot of people that came that had been given information prior to that that was false. So it was a good time to talk about it. The thing that upset me the most though was I watched people who were obviously, I don't know if they're paid or not, but they were working the lines before you go vote. They were also working the crowds for certain candidates. 
Yeah. That, that quite frankly upset me that I thought, wow, that's the first time I've seen that. Yeah, the the caucus like system it. is an election Didn't like in its it. own way, right? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Go ahead. I just think it's interesting, though, if it's going to cost them less per delegate, so to speak, what would it matter if most of those people don't care? You know, if it makes any sense. I know it's hard to find who cares and who doesn't, but I think the people that came here care today. Right. We're the ones voicing the opinion. And so it's important to focus your attention on getting us to come. You want to get everyone to come, but in this sense, 6.5 million for all those delegates saying that that's a bunch of wasted money when you're spending even more money on people that really don't care. I, I think, mean, I, I, think I would disagree. Delegates. I think they do care. I call out the delegates. I, I would say the, Utahns do yeah, care. And just because they're not at a caucus meeting does not mean they don't care. Yeah, go ahead. Have you taken the time to look at the, the data to find out what the candidate spends Convention to what they spent in a primary. Over what? Because you're promoting I, you, primary, <clears throat> right? And I know that the, the number, no, this is just caucus and convention, right. not the but, primary. Right? And see, I'm i worried. I mean, Utah is the best managed state, and we've got this system, and it's working. And the, and the and Pew we, Center, and to, and and just for comparison, the Pew Center, who named us the best managed state in 2008. Just in February of this year, they also said we have the tenth worst election administration in system in the country. And and so it's not like everybody else. It's okay. Go ahead. Hello. Hi. I was elected a state delegate, not at the last caucus, but the caucus before I went. There were sixty to eighty people there, and the obvious thing was most people didn't feel like they had the time to be a delegate. They cared. They were there because they cared. They voted for me because I promised I would spend a ton of time. I would read everything that came to me. I would go to everything I possibly could to listen. I read the complete websites. I read everything that came in the mail. They called me on the phone. They'd stay after and talk to me, just me, face to face. And I spent many, many, many hours and really got to know the candidates well. And I think that that is the beautiful thing about the caucus. I think the average person doesn't feel like they have the time to spend. And so they vote for those people that they trust that will spend that time. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. I, just, I just need to counter that by saying, that's cool for some people. I'm not one of them. I would rather see the 2% threshold and pick from a set of candidates that best fit my personal philosophy. So, are you going to find out their Okay, David, go ahead. You just get your dad's on TV and on the radio. That's it. Sorry, folks. I, I know. I, I just want to make sure we, we finish up here by we can. So I understand not all of you support us, and that's great, right? I, I think it's important to have the discussion and the dialogue. And, you know, if, if you oppose our efforts, then uh, we encourage you to pursue, you know, that opposition and, and be an engaged citizen. If you do wish to support us, then... There are some simple ways that we would ask you to have your help. Uh, maybe you can help us put our name on our PowerPoint. That'd be good. Go ahead, David. Next one. So, okay, and so these are just some con some contact information here for you. Again, my name is Taylor. I'm one of two executive directors. Lindsay Zumbo is my counterpart. She is a, a Democratic Party state delegate, and I actually made her go down to the Provo today, so I can come here. So hopefully she's okay. And then Aaron is working with David and, and our volunteers coordinating statewide. So there's some contact information there. Um, and so yeah, go ahead, sir. Come on. Um, so the so the gist of the whole the thing is that that not enough people being represented correctly. Is that my correct in that? Um, so not enough representation. The lack of voter participation and the exclusionary nature of the caucus system that excludes participation. Yeah. Okay. Now if if that is oh sir that my own question. Um, Rather than hammering this whole thing with a sledgehammer, why not just do a better chance, uh, a better job of advertising the caucus system? Well, we did that last year, right? And it worked. You know, like, well, but, but I'm sorry, but again, last year in the record high participation of caucus of all caucuses in Utah history, fewer people attended caucus meetings than voted in municipal elections. So we're getting still a very small percentage of Utahns who go. Because it's, it excludes so many Utahns who are at work, who are, you know, have children that they can't leave, who are in the military, who are overseas for whatever, you know. So it, it excludes those folks simply because they can't be physically present. Go ahead. 
what is the sponsoring organization or group or whatever that's promoting this? Is this a, a party or is it a... It's, uh, a yeah, that's a good question. So we are registered as a political issues committee. And the name of that political issues committee is Alliance for Good Government. And it was formed two years ago. And uh, the name Count My Vote hadn't quite been developed. And so the Alliance for Good Government was a pick name, but we are now a DBA with the Lieutenant Governor's Office. Alliance for Good Government, Count My Vote. And so if you want to see our disclosures, our donations, uh, everybody who's contributed to us and all the expen expenditures we've made, you can go to the Lieutenant Governor's website. Uh, and that is uh, disclosures.utah.gov. And you can, in the public search box, type in Alliance for Good Government. And then you can go see all of our disclosures there. So that's, that's the legal the legal name, although it's all now DBA, count my vote. Yeah, go ahead. I agree that there's a problem with voter turnout, but it's not just a problem in the state of Utah, it's throughout the entire country. Do you think that, because you're looking at the voter turnout for general elections and you're seeing it dropping and dropping and dropping, do you feel that maybe attacking the caucus system um, is, and pointing that as the problem for low voter turnout, is kind of flawed, there's a flaw in your Well, election. we're not attacking the caucus system. But by one. doing this, you'll In number two, Utah's caucus participation caucus. rate is substantially lower than the national rate, and all of our socioeconomic indicators would point to much higher turnout in other states. So yes, we, we believe it's the caucus system because it excludes so many voters. So, okay, so this is our information. Um, I, thank you so much for coming. Uh, please tell your friends, family, neighbors, those who couldn't be here with us today in person, they can get on and join our online hearing on Saturday. Uh, we have some information and cards. I'll be happy to stay after and chat with anyone who'd like to, uh, to ask any other questions or talk, but I think uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up today so everybody can get back to, to work or back to their uh, Wednesday. So thank you for coming. Appreciate it.